Good afternoon. I'm greeting you from the Recession Generation 2016 conference here in Oakland, California. July 9, 2016. My name is David Geese and I'm with the CommonsSF.org, a group that's committed to asking the question and driving action that addresses the, the matter of who owns the value of geography. We believe that that is key to answering and ad or addressing and answering, in fact, many of the crises in the housing sector and in the wage sector. It's my honor to introduce to you the Building a Better Global Economy panel. Panelists will share their experiences and particular insights into the state of the global economic affairs and how we on both the individual and national levels can contribute towards the building of a stronger and more just global economy. The format of the panel is as follows. Each panelist will have 10 minutes to introduce her or himself, their organization, their work, and share their perspective on this topic. After each panelist has had the chance to speak, I will perhaps have time to moderate a discussion among the panelists, and then if there is any remaining time, we will invite questions from the audience that may occur outside. Or during the break. Or during the break. Thank you. So, I, I believe the order has already been determined and I will ask you to begin. Please. Hi, um, I'll show you a small video and then and then we will um, start the discussion. silent movies, that's a good way to start the session. Um, kind of channel the energy, refocus us from all the good stuff that's been going on today. Um, my name is Chaki Joki, and I am the founder and CEO of Kikwetu Coffee. Kikwetu Coffee is um, a company that um, is uh, really focused on working uh, very strongly with um, African farmers to provide and bring coffee to the Western world. Uh, and not only the West, but the East, but really more importantly is empowering that, um, that farmer. And I'll tell you kind of how we do it. Um, what you guys were seeing here is um, just a little history about coffee. How many of you guys drink coffee every day? Yeah? All right. Uh, two cups a day, maybe? Okay, okay. Um, do you miss a day of coffee ever? No. Yes? Oh, no? 
I do. You do? Uh, Maybe one. Because I choose to, so I don't get hooked. You <laughs> get hooked on it. All right. So um, we're not the only ones, apparently, which is a beautiful thing. It's it's been happening for millennia. Um, so coffee originated from Ethiopia, the highlands of Ethiopia, and um, the way it came about is there was a farmer. Um, uh, actually a herder, he was a goat herder named Kaldi. So Kaldi noticed that, um, and that's kind of what the presentation was, was talking about, but Kaldi noticed that um, whenever his goats chewed on a certain coffee, I mean a certain berry of a certain tree, they were overly energetic throughout the day. And out of curiosity, he kind of followed them and, and, and picked the berries and went home and created this concoction. And it wasn't very nice tasting, but it got him energetic and it gave him some sort of pep uh, to kind of go through his day. So he ran down to the monastery and shared with his local um, you know, monk and told him, you know, I discovered this thing and you wouldn't believe it, we're staying away instead of taking those afternoon siestas we were taking, we, we don't need it anymore. So of course, um, the monk took it in and tried it and it worked. Like he was staying alert longer during prayers. So he of course shared it with his monks in Yemen and they decided they were gonna take it on and use it as a way of staying a little longer and, and staying alert a little bit longer um, during their prayer sessions. So their prayer sessions were um, more, um, I guess they got a lot more out of it. The economists would be happy that I referenced a little bit of economics there. Um, but so that's what happened, that's how kind of coffee came about. So um, in that time, there was a lot of trading from the Arabias. People would come into, into Mecca to kind of do the, you know, the ritual. And uh, there was trading, there was this you know, Trans-Saharan um, Arabian trade. A lot of trading was going back and forth. So coffee um, started getting um, sort of diverse, I mean, sort of dispersed across the nations. And the Dutch got a hold of it and um, came into Europe with it. So that's kind of how coffee came into Europe. And King Henry the Fourteenth heard about it, and he was like, "What? What? What is this? You guys are talking about? How come I don't have my own tree?" So he had tried, you know, his people. He had tried um, to kind of grow a tree. It didn't work very well because it was too cold where he was. So um, he had the Dutch had, a, you know, pretty good coffee seeds, and they owed him a favor. So he got a tree, um, his very own tree that was in a greenhouse and that was catered to by his servants. And um, and it's it's said that from that one tree um, that was King Henry the Fourth, it's uh, King Henry the Fourteenth came millions and millions of um, coffee trees were born around the world. So fast forward to modern day. Um, we live in the Bay Area, which is, of course, um, specialty coffee central. Um, one of the things that um, we know here in the Bay Area is that we can get really good coffee, right? And we have quite a few choices. And we needn't get bad coffee if we don't want to. Once you get one bad latte, you'll never go back to that spot because you know you can go to some uh, another place. Now, what Kikwetu Coffee does is we take that a little bit further um, as far as making it a business and, and as far as really bringing it back to our farmers. Um, so right now, um, some facts about coffee is that it's one of the, um, second to crude oil, it's the most popular and the most valuable commodity in the world second to crude oil. Uh, it's been happening, it's been that way for many, many years. So coffee is here to stay. Um, out of any industry that we can invest in, that we can get guaranteed on globally, the coffee industry, if you're not in oil, coffee would be the next big thing. Um, so with that notation, um, one of the things that differentiates Kikwetu Coffee is that not only do we know it's a viable business opportunity for obviously millennials like you or great thinkers or in, in in, you know, industry interruptions like you, but we know that we can make a difference for the farmers. And the way we do that is very simply, and I'll wrap it up, is we cre have created a value system for the farmers. So where um, coffee is a little controlled in the continent of Africa, we have about six countries that we represent. Um, you saw a little image there that talks about three lists had a, conducted, um, um, they conducted a panel and out of the top 10, three of those countries were from Africa, meaning top 10 of the best coffee in the world. Three of them are, were out of Africa. But it's a little controlled. The farmer was kind of lost in, the, in that path, meaning they were not getting paid what they um, was owed to them. And there was a big process. It was the farmer, the brokers, the millers, the, everybody but the farmer. The farmer seldom gets paid. So we're changing that and we're kind of retelling the narrative of the African farmer by doing this very key thing, is we're buying directly from the farmers, we're paying them above market price, and we're empowering them by 
getting their own washing stations and we can talk a little bit later about what the process is maybe during the open discussion but now they're kind of buying in they kind of own some of the business so they don't have to outsource it which means that they're getting a little bit of value on the on the grassroots level and um, and we're eliminating the broker so we don't have the broker anymore so directly from us uh, to the farmers we buy the coffee and we bring it to the Bay Area and really a lot of places around the world and you guys get to enjoy that so um, we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that but that's really what Kikwe to Coffee is about empowering the well number one a great business venture number two empowering the coffee um, the African coffee farmer to be able to sustain it to be able to pass it on to the next generation and and we're taking on the baton and it's it's working fantastically good afternoon everyone can everyone hear me Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Recession Generation. I'm excited to be here with you all. My name is Kiki Mwiti, and uh, I was born and raised in Nairobi, and that is in the capital, that's the capital city of Kenya. Uh, for those of you who do not know where Kenya is, it's on the east coast of Africa. Um, I grew up uh, in the midst of a new generation, a new generation of young people who are very enterprising, who were inspired by the generation before and our new leadership to take on uh, new opportunities. And out of that, I grew up looking around me and seeing people of my generation, young people of my generation, come up with new creative ways to express themselves. Um, fast forward a couple of years later, uh, I've lived in the Bay Area for about four or five years now. And uh, my career, really my career history is in consulting. Um, I've always been a consultant and mostly uh, what I really focus on has been with a lot of uh, Western companies looking to um, expand into the global economy, as well as local global uh, local companies in emerging markets trying to uh, expand onto a global scale. And so over the years, one by one, working with different organizations, different companies, um, has been very rewarding because what it does is that it opens up our eyes to what technology and what uh, global globalization is doing uh, across the world. I'm sure everybody noticed the whole um, Brexit situation across our media screens. And that is just an example of what globalization is doing around the world. Um, about two, three years ago, I was approached by uh, two or three uh, venture capital companies here in the Bay Area and what they were doing is they wanted to travel around the world to discover the different ways that globalization and technology is taking over major cities in emerging markets and that would be major hubs in Latin America, major hubs in Asia, major hu hubs in Brazil, as well as major hubs in Africa. Um, the countries that they focused on in Africa was specifically uh, Afri uh, Kenya and Ethiopia. And what was interesting during that time of my work with them was that it was very extensive, it was very labor uh, inducing because we were doing it over the phone, a lot of emails back and forth, the time zone was very exhausting. And out of that experience, um, what we realized is that a lot of entrepreneurs in emerging markets are ready to get onto the global scale. They're ready to trade, they're ready to interact with people around the world, but they're not able to do so because they're underfunded and they're underexposed. People just don't know about them. If you used Waze, for example, Waze is a new app, the new GPS app, that is a innovation that was created outside of the US. If you use Spotify, if you use Skype, all all of these are innovations that had they not received funding from the West, we would not be able to uh, utilize them. And so out of my experiences with these um, organizations during that time of uh, the tour of these investors, we came up um, out of our frustration is we launched a new platform, which we called Globally, which really just allows for investors and startups and found founders of those startups to connect on a global scale and be able to 
to interact and invest in each other, whether it's ed cross educational investing, but mostly funding. And so I think one of the things that we'll, I'm excited to talk about on this panel is really how um, we're able to connect around the world on a global scale in better ways than before. Um, technology is moving at such a fast pace. And uh, I think we'll discuss more about that in a little bit, I'm sure. I'll just pass it on so at least you can get introductions got the way. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Athol Halle, I'm the Chief Executive of Groundswell and uh, my presentation is about UK homelessness and transforming service delivery. Uh, so uh, I'll just to tell you a little bit about Groundswell, we're a homelessness charity that was, is, it's just our 20th anniversary, it was set up in 1996, I've personally been involved since 99 and have been CEO for the last 10 years. I'm currently on a sabbatical, which is how come I'm over in the Bay Area, and I, uh, which is a wonderful opportunity to meet some new people and find out some, some stuff and hopefully share a bit of the story of Groundswell as well. Um, so we're based in London, which is over in the UK, uh, which is in Europe, or at least was in Europe till a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, so just a quick overview, I'm going to talk a bit about Groundswell's core beliefs around our kind of journey to deliver, uh, to become a service delivery organisation, in particular our main project which is called Homeless Health Peer Advocacy, and then hopefully try and make a more general point which is useful uh, around service delivery. So we are a charity that comes from a set of core beliefs. Firstly, we believe that the whole community benefits when we tackle homelessness. We don't see homelessness as being homeless people's problem, it's society's problem. Uh, you know, we believe that people are society's most precious re resource and that when we allow or let people kind of rot on our streets, we all miss out from the benefit that those people have to contribute to society. You know, we believe there is no them and us, only us, and that means it takes everybody, if it's society's problem, homelessness, then it takes it, the whole of society to come together to address that. So that be people experiencing homelessness, but also, you know, local authorities, politicians, service delivery, and just general members of the community. And, you know, fundamentally, we believe involvement works, and that is involving people with experience of homelessness in tackling homelessness. So if we uh, involve people in services, we end up with better services. If we involve people in forming policy, that's the way to get the most effective policy. Not only that, but the act of being involved, we see as being what is most personally transformative in people's journeys out of homelessness. So as an organisation, we've, uh, I'll talk us through this uh, journey quickly, but we've been, you know, campaigning and then service, we, we've been uh, delivering involvement work and, and this HHPA work I'm going to talk about. And the thing that's kind of, even though that's kind of three very different types of organisation we've been over the years, it's that set of core beliefs that has been strong, which has kind of kept us grounded. So. To go back, so originally uh, we came out, at, we were set up as a sort of campaigning organisation. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, homelessness was a very significant issue in England. Um, and there was, you know, there started to be a movement of campaigning about better services and changing policy to, to, to address that. And, uh, and Groundswell was kind of, uh, the, or the, the, the precursors to Groundswell were at the forefront of that. And, uh, in particular for campaigning for homeless people to have a voice uh, in sorting things out. So in those days it was kind of bright colours and loud slogans involving a lot of people ooh, it's just, you know, uh, in sorting out uh, the issue and that's, you know, things like sleep, uh, speak out not sleep out and we organised a lot of events bringing homeless people directly together with decision makers and here uh, on the left we've got Jimmy Carlson who was uh, one of our first volunteers uh, who was someone who spent over 20 years rough sleeping himself then started to get involved in kind of advocacy you know sort of turned his own life around through that and he's remained in, uh, connected to the organization ever since and here's you know example of speaking out to then which is you know sort of uh, 
Dame Louise Casey, who at the time was um, le led on homelessness policy, and Mo Molan, who was the cabinet minister uh, for social exclusion with responsibility for homelessness, and we were able to sort of get homeless people and decision makers talking directly. Uh, and then sort of things changed uh, after the sort of the turn of the century. We had things like uh, a Homelessness Act, which meant every local authority had to consult with homeless people in order to form a local homelessness strategy. And we had supporting people, which was the funding stream for all homelessness services, which suddenly uh, was required to involve and consult with people who use services. So for the first time, homeless people sort of had uh, a voice sort of you know, in policy and services. So Groundswell had to change tack a little bit and we had to sort of stop telling people to, sort of, uh, to involve people and actually start helping them do it. So we sort of changed tack and we, we developed a lot of peer research that is involving homeless people, people with experience of homelessness in all stages of the research process. Um, and we did, uh, you know, uh, we did homeless strategies around the country and worked with homelessness agencies to help them develop client involvement uh, strategies that, you know, ways to get people using services uh, have a much more meaningful role in the way that they were delivered. So from doing all this work, kind of what did we learn? Uh, well, the first thing was that we found that health was an incredibly significant area which was largely neglected by homelessness services. Um, there's some stats here from Homeless Link, it's sort of their main second tier body. Uh, you know, 70% of homeless people have got a significant health issue, enormous overuse of A&E um, in any single health issue, so, you know, seven times more likely to die from a respiratory health issue, you know, uh, enormously overrepresented in TB, sort of take any health issue and homeless people, uh, you know, uh, suffer from it enormously more and at much greater expense. Um, and then we tried to understand what were the barriers to people addressing health needs and we overcame kind of systemic barriers which is things like you know the way you got a hospital appointment was to get a letter sent to you now if you don't have a stable address that's pretty worthless sort of practical barriers like important operations are conducted you know within London across the other side of town you, you need public transport to get there and you need money and and support to kind of get past security and receptions and also some personal barriers of people you know who maybe have communication issues uh, around mental health uh, situations or drug and alcohol use which mean that it's very difficult for people to get to get their health needs met excuse me uh, and then also you know in the broader scheme of things there became you know a greater understanding of homelessness there was a, a significant piece of research DCLG which is the Department for Communities and Local Government which is the, the government department with responsibility for homelessness uh, you know, uh, you know, did a study and they suggesting that you know over 60% of people using homelessness services had a diagnosable personality disorder, which is you know uh, contrasts with 10% in the general population, and which is characterised largely by such uh, you know things as finding it uh, difficult to work well effectively with authority. I think you know personality disorder, not the greatest term, often called complex trauma these days. And then we, there was a, an enormous study of, I think the largest in the UK by Harriet Watt University about multiple exclusion uh, homelessness, which uh, saw the journeys of, of a lot, you know, uh, thousands of homeless people uh, and, and saw that majority of people had been through three or four iterations of services before they ended up homeless. So that's things like either people who'd grown up in care, people who'd been through uh, prison system, people who'd been through mental health services, drug and alcohol services, and hadn't got a good result, and then go on to the next. And that homeless Homelessness isn't so much a thing in itself as it's the homeless services are the place that people end up when other services fail them. So uh, we conducted our own research, the escape plan, which was looking at the critical success factors in people moving on from homelessness. And the key thing that we uncovered was how important volunteering was. Uh, and that how you know that, that, that when people are trying to move on people kind of need to be needed and make a contribution and you know any services which were preventing people from making a contribution and trying to do things to people weren't being successful but as soon as you gave people an opportunity that was helping people move on and then you know we're saying so if somebody needs to 
uh, make a contribution, then you know how could, you know what have you got if you've been homeless? Well, you've got the experience of homelessness, which uh, and that gives you the ability, in, largely, to often relate to and empathise with other people going through that situation. So, you know, it's there's a big trust. Uh, situation that's occurring there and also it's an inspiration that if you've been homeless and you're now working with people you can sort of show people that there is a way out so we created homeless health peer advocacy which is a service which is kind of very practically it's about peers that's people with who, volunteers people who've been homeless themselves physically picking people up and accompanying them to health appointments and you know that has proved to be increased attendance uh, at health appointments up to 87 percent within our client group and it's 88 percent in the general population over half of our volunteers go on to get jobs through doing that volunteering work we had an independent study showing that we reduce nhs that's the national health service uh, costs by f over 40 percent and uh, this year we won a, a the GSK Impact Award, which is uh, for UK charities sort of working in health. So, yeah, just to whiz through the last couple of slides. So it was, yeah, uh, you know, it, we, we started with 100 engagements just to test it out. And the last couple of years, is we now do 3,000 engagements a year and plan to take that national. So just the context in, in the UK is that rough sleeping is increasing enormously and funding is decreasing. So we've got a real situation on our hands. You know, we need to do things differently. This increasing supply, uh, I mean, sorry, increasing demand, reducing supply is going to go somewhere. So my final point is about a more generic point around service delivery and that is we can no longer just keep rolling out home, homeless services which do things to people it's too expensive and there's not the resources anymore I'm happy to have this as a whether it's morally wrong or not uh, to, if there's a conversation later I believe so but also it's just ineffective okay but if you do things with people and that is in support people to be involved in solutions to homelessness it's a win for the clients, the people experiencing homelessness, for the volunteers delivering it, for the health services get a lot of support and ultimately for the public person reducing that burden which is good for everybody. And just to conclude, so Jimmy, our first kind of volunteer who helped set up the organisation, received an OBE recently for services and you know his catchphrase, you know he's saying he spent 20 years as people uh, sort of lying on the street with people stepping over him and you know and his and he's turned it around and you know his catchphrase if that's the right word is never give up on anyone and I would like to convey that to you and I'm around in the Bay Area for the next few weeks so please if anyone would like to uh, show get in touch about the projects you're involved with I'd love to come and visit uh, that's me and there's my contact details thank you very much Good evening. My name is Catherine Wajiko Dungo Case. I am from Kenya as well. There's two others here that are from Kenya, so this is really amazing to be able to sit together with um, folks from my homeland, but talking on different topics or different um, direct, coming from different directions to tackle the same the same discussion. Thank you very much. Um, three things define me, rather more than three. Um, first of all, I support clinical research activity at a local hospital um, health institution. I serve on several boards and more importantly today I am the founder of a local nonprofit called Chesanami Foundation. Chesanami is Swahili which is one of the languages spoken in Kenya that means come play with me. I believe in play. I believe in having fun. I believe in looking, life, looking at life and dealing with social issues as we have them here in a way that's welcoming of the entire community. And so Chesanami believes in a play-based approach to education. And for us, education is cultural education, ever more so because when you th think about the social energy around us today, more importantly, um, we have forgotten how to communicate with one another. We've forgotten how to look at each other as human beings. And so our focus for the last five years has been to go out to our communities and to remind us what the philosophy of human kindness is. 
what it means to be able to sit in a room with people who are diverse, different from us, but what it means when we're able to come together and learn how to work together towards solutions. That means solutions for your immediate needs. Is it going out into the community and supporting people who are less fortunate? Is it a business venture that has the potential to capitulate an entire population and make life better for a larger group of people? Or is it just for you at home with your family, with your children? How do you learn to look at folks from the elemental um, state? You know, everybody's a human being. Let's take it from there, right? We might be different, but it doesn't matter. We can still find a way to work together. And so we visit schools, we visit communities, um, we visit corporations. And our core work in schools is to remind students to celebrate diversity and to be global citizens so that when they leave and they have taken with them all of the elementary particles of what it means to be an adult with them as they go out to college, for example, that they can be able to translate those teachings from their parents, from their educators, into something that's competent. That they can be able to utilize their resources that they've learned as competent members of the community. So that when they go out there and there are future change makers creating these solutions for problems we have in the world, they can do it in a way that serves others. So that's our core. Um, when I came to this country, I didn't have a dollar in my pocket. I didn't know anybody. But I look at myself 16 years later and say, I've been able to find a niche for myself. I've been able to find a problem in my community. And I've been able to bring a solution that's welcoming of others in a way that does not pay attention to how different we look. And for me, that is my message to millennials, and I'm hoping that we get a chance to discuss that here today, is how do we go out there as millennials? We're the future change makers. We're out there to make you know, big money, or create big companies, or create a remarkable um, electronic tool. But how do we do that in a way that thinks of the entire community as a whole and that's welcoming of everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Kisia Gonzalez. I am medical doctor by profession, uh, but uh, I guess by practice an economist I turn into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I. Uh, Um, how I get involved in, uh, in this movement, it was in uh, the regular struggle of individuals that come seeking a new life in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> I always tell this story that I see an ad, I saw an ad in the, in the newspaper that was saying inviting for free classes in economics. And uh, I say, okay, I don't know anything of economics. But back in my mind, I held uh, a memory of my professor of tropical medicine that one day, closing the, the, the grades, he said, you know, remember something. There is no tropical diseases. There are economic diseases. Did it make sense to me? But when I was sitting at that uh, conference room, Every time ca everything came to light. And I said, oh my God, now I understand. I'm original from Honduras, Central America. I, um, I look black, and I am a black person. I, uh, speak Spanish as a first language, but also I am indigenous. My community was originated in the Grenadines, and we call ourselves Garifunas. Uh, we have tradition, religion, food, every cultural aspect in la, at, at least present yet in our life. And uh, we are living in, the, in Central America alongside the whole five uh, nations that conform Central America. And uh, as whatever we go, we, uh, the people that look like me or like us, always has to struggle a little more, harder. And it's not that I'm here pulling up 
a little flag like, oh, we are victims. No, I don't play that game. But it's something that today I realize is more and more that while we were speaking and going around these conversations, now we're talking about global economy and we came from local economy and it's exactly the same. Local economy is the origin of the global economy. It's in a more larger scale and presents some problems. It's more problematic. Like we didn't have more time to ask a question, but I have in my mind this. How those local people who are trying to establish a new way to develop commerce among a small communities, how they are preparing for the growth, the population growth, and the community around of them uh, continue to grow and have to demand more exchange. How are we gonna go from barter and current uh, you know, how we're gonna go, how we're gonna transcend that, pr that process. And I don't have the answer, but I think that coming from my mentality in my profession, we cannot solve no problem if we don't know what origina originates that problem. We need to connect cause and effect. And cause and effect is exactly the origin of economics, right? Because we have as a human being, that is one of the important elements to produce to, in order to survive in a more uh, intermingling uh, community, we cannot produce like the tribal man that can survive by himself because, because he knows how to defend himself and do everything. In society we have is mandatory, is consequential of the development and the uh, develop of human beings to start to divide the process of production. So the topic that we have to develop is, is really attracts me very much because it's questioning how do we can get better the global economy. So there is a problem when we transcend the stage of tribal living, the life, we have to share everything. And, and what happened with that sharing? Uh, globalization, I heard that word, but it's so easy to repeat the word, and I'm not quite sure that all we are conscious when we using the word globalization and what it means. It means to have a core, a structure that create the condition in, we, in which we are living, and by what, why? we are struggling to survive and to make ends meet. That is, that is fundamental for me in order to connect what I do. Uh, one of the Georgia's organization that I represent uh, has a consultative status at the United Nations and I'm a, I am an NGO representative to the United Nations of the International Union for Land Value Taxation, which is an organization based in London. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we are there trying to offer the idea that through our philosophy we know that we can offer individual solution of uh, bring equality and eradication of uh, poverty. So thinking of what we, we're going to do, what we have to do, uh, and how to manage this condition, I just want to highlight two things. Economics, global economics, as well as local economy, is a process that had two very important ingredients, human beings, in the sharing of the planet, the earth, that doesn't belong to us, we didn't create it. So we have to come up with a solution that provide exactly everything, fundamental needs for everybody, and that is uh, what Henry George expressed in his remedy, as remedy for uh, the inequality that he starts seeing, and precisely his observation were initiated here in, in, in California is by taxing the rent 
of the land or the value that each of us is creating by living and sharing the land and the natural resources. So what we're seeking is the opportunity to open up the condition that we can try that the application of the land value rent capture that nobody stays with the with the surplus of that production, but yet to be shared with all the community for fundamental uh, subsidize the fundamental needs, which is no need for homelessness, right? Because we all, as a human being, we have that human right. And I think this is, uh, I will leave it here because I was designed, but uh, I didn't want it to, to let go without calling the attention that there is a structural condition that we have to fight, and that is the political system that conditioning us to uh, be deprived of the rent value that we all help to create. And in the round of, we have time, I could answer and explain a little more of what we do through that. Thank you. We live in accelerating times. What I mean by that is the level of our technology, our interconnectedness, the ability to transit goods, people, ideas, systems of thought are speeding up at rates that we could never have imagined previously. This is going to have uh, put immense stress in how we develop an educated citizenry. Um, well, my name is Frank Ortiz. I am a professional educator. All right. um, I was part of the machine that was all about producing students who had to work the same, think the same, whose schedules insofar as when they arrive, when they leave, when they eat, when they go to the bathroom were all predetermined. And I'm going to tell you right now that that system is insufficient. Um, that system is failing us. It is not producing the kinds of workers, entrepreneurs, critical thinkers that we need to evolve into uh, becoming our best selves, both individually and as a people. Um, so with this, let me tell you a story about a school. It is called the Philadelphia Free School. It is by model a democratic school. There is about 50 to 60 children in that school, ranging from ages 3 to 18. And in, within the school, every single person has a single vote. They have weekly meetings where they assemble and they determine the rules of the school. There are no teachers. There are professional workers who are there to mentor those students. And the students, from the time they walk in at 9 a.m. until they can leave at 4, they can stay until 6, determine how they spend their time. Now, the, the, the traditionalist will hear this, and they will ask me some variant of the following question. How do you hold them accountable? And then I tell them, worst case scenario, the kid will take out their phone, start playing video games, call their friends, and that will happen for a time. It may be a few hours, days, or even weeks. But eventually that child will notice that no one's chasing them, yelling at them, saying, shouldn't you be doing something else? And then something else happens. That child finds a passion. Music, literature, art, mathematics, science, exercise, doesn't matter what it is, they find it. And once they've got that buy-in factor, they choose, they, they, they pursue it with a depth of passion that is unrivaled. And this happens systematically with every single child that goes into that school eventually. Uh, such that when they leave that school, they actually have a professional level skill within that chosen field.
And they may even change their mind, and that's completely okay too. The reason why I brought that up is it offers an insight to going from the factory level model that we have in the United States and overseas and going to something that a little more open-ended, a more self-determinist model um, where the individual finds what they want to learn and then proceeds to go find the resources, the individuals to access to make that happen. All right. Um, I didn't come across this by accident. This was more of a growth process. Um, I, and, and when I say I was a part of the machine, I was the one who was the teacher in front that made sure all 30 kids in my class were doing the same thing at the same time and doing it at the same level of aptitude. And I was so thoroughly bought into that system, I developed my own authoritarian means of ensuring compliance from modifying my greeting, my assessment, my attendance, um, all into one system that was insanely easy for me to work on and modify. Um, I'm not proud of that. And I did that for far too long. And the fact that I, um, I wasted so much time with so many people was something that I'm going to have to accept. But the best that I could do is change that and promote a different way. Um, it was expensive in terms of time for my students. It was expensive in terms of time of myself as a teacher. Uh, and I couldn't handle it. I had to take some time away. So I took a year off. And along that way, I, I came across an opportunity to mentor a robotics club in a predominantly Puerto Rican American school that was consistently performing below standard levels for Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and especially the United States. I walked in, I recognized immediately that the four boys that were showing up had a strong aptitude in, in mechanics, circuits. What they needed though was a capacity for direction. So all I did the first day was I, I gave them paper, I gave them pencil, um, and say, go draw examples of robots that you might want to compete with because they would, they would eventually build one and compete against other schools. Schools with better funding, students with better education, and greater numbers, far greater numbers. They came back, they had ideas, I had them come together and negotiate what that would happen. Again, all I did was suggest an end result and I stepped back. Eventually, they built the robots, they had results, and I suggested, all right, so what can you do to make it better? And then they got together, they thought about it some more. Now, where I'm going with this is just by offering what I call objective-based learning, where all I did was I specified an end result and left it up to them to determine that. They were able to self-determine the means with which to produce that end result. All right. They wound up, th these four young men, 15 years old, beating schools that had 20, 30, 100 kids in their robotics club. They had multiple teams, multiple robots. They still beat them. All right. All I did was I set them free. And that is the power of human imagination, creativity, unleashed. Later on, I would become a cycling coach at Strawberry Mansion High School in Philadelphia. Now, this is a school that was featured by ABC News as one of the worst high schools in the United States. I walked in and I used the concept of play in my practices where every single drill, they competed against each other. They went nuts. They loved it. I started to have, well, hey, let me tell you more about this. This was, uh, we, keep, we competed with other schools through a foundation called the Cadence Youth Cycling Program. Um, so we were competing against other schools. I started having kids coming from other teams and joining in my practices. Because again, all I did was I said, guys, produce this outcome. And then they went to, they took care of it. And, it was, and because it was so much fun, they, went, they wanted to do that. I used play 
and open-endedness. Um, around that time, I got hired, well, I was attending Temple University as a, as a mechanical engineering graduate student. They happened to find out, mostly because I had the audacity to ask for a position so I can teach the TAs and professors how to teach. And it takes a lot of gall to go and do that. My department chair, who is now my boss, said as much and said that's very entrepreneurial to come to me and ask me for this. Let me give you a teaching position first and see how good you are. All right, I employed a model where, in essence, every day my students teach each other. I give them objectives in advance. I have them go through and put together PowerPoint slides and they teach their peers. Their peers grade them. Um, whether they, their time is fully utilized or it's completely wasted. And at the end of the year, they go through and they build their independent research on um, what, uh, a number of contemporary topics from biotech, nanotech, and such. So I guess if I had to wrap up my talk, I'd say we need to change the way we educate ourselves, our children, so that we don't depend on having to induce compliance, so that we allow choice in the schools, how we spend our time. Um, we even have to eliminate the fact that we sort people by age, which is probably the worst thing we could do. Because we all learn differently. We all learn at different rates. We all learn in different environments. Um, and we, are, we should be welcome to change our mind, whether we're 5, 10, 20, or 50. All right? And with this, just think about Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders didn't go and become big until he was 66. And he had the audacity to go ask 99 people to say, hey, I've got this fried chicken. It's a great idea. It tastes great. Maybe we can make stores out of it. But he, and he did this at such a late age and was willing to go to depth to do that to make it happen. But it only happens when we allow people the freedom, opportunity, to fully self-determine. So with that, um, I humbly say, there you go. <laughs> Ultimately, it's all about you, OK? Thank you, panelists. I have some specific questions for each of our speakers. And I, uh, but what occurred for me is a unifying theme uh, in all of this. And that is, how do we create buy-in? The peers in the homeless uh, realm, play, um, the, the students. How do we create, a, in your particular instance, you're, you're citing there's an object to, to be had, but how do we get engagement by the players? And at uniting both the macroeconomic, the big picture, and the, but using these case studies, a few of which were cited, I'm going to put to the panel not only some specific questions, but this question, and this should be where a discussion might occur. How do we create buy-in in the play space that we all inhabit, the geography we all occupy. Many of you are, are now living in the Bay region by choice. Some of you are visiting, but in any event, this geography, not just the local regional economy, but the, the world economy, how do we create the sense of belonging to place in an economic sense, a real economic sense, so that we, we have an object which is our own satisfaction, our own betterment, but also the community's betterment, a, a social sense. How does that consciousness, social consciousness arise? Perhaps out of what I'm calling play, I have s some very specific thoughts about this myself, but I'm not going to intrude those at this moment in any event. So if any of you would like to take up that large question of how do we create a, a buy-in by all participants, everyone in the community. You, you take that up now or I can play with some uh, specific questions. It looks. Sure. Okay. So I think the answers, the answers that we might get today might, diff, you know, might be different of course, different fields because everybody's bringing a different um, set of experience. But for me, it's got to be needs-based. The buy-in that you might get from a community that, say, is in the Western world might be completely different from a community that's in a different part of the globe. And when I say needs-based, I mean a solution that's created by a young boy in a little Maasai village 
where he innovatively, without resources, the modern resources that you think of, that will allow you to create a solar system that will keep, that will keep his little village lit at night so that the lions do not come imposing on them and taking away their food would not be the same for somebody living in Silicon Valley who needs a solar system so that they can save on how expensive electricity has become paying to PG&E. So I think buy-in has to be needs-based, but certainly the core discussion about the need to create solutions that can support the economy at large across the globe regardless of what that specific need is, we all know we need specific solutions. We need to eat better. We need to have more water. We need to, I don't know, communicate across the board. We need to just create solutions. One, it's the basic solution is whatever the resource that's needed by the community, but a better understanding what each of those individual communities across the board what, what their basic need is so that when you're applying that solution, it applies to that particular um, setting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just adding on to kind of piggybacking on what Catherine is talking about. So for us, it's um, needs-based, and of course, it's very different. So we um, are working on both continents. So we're in America, uh, of course, because we're in the Bay Area, that's kind of where we're based. And we're also in, uh, we have a headquarters in Nairobi. Um, and from there, we can reach our farmers in Burundi or um, Ethiopia or Uganda. But one of the things that for us has been vital and of utmost importance is number one, sort of creating, like tying the value back to the farmers. Because the farmers were just the people that produced the coffee and they, the coffee left and they never, they, I mean, they were poor, they couldn't educate their children, um, you know, it, my generation. So um, what we've found is, uh, my background is that my grandmother raised her nine children from her coffee farm. And um, my grandfather died um, when I think her middle child was probably, you know, in their teenage years. So the rest of the time it was her farm that actually sustained, um, the, the, sustained the family. And that, business kind of skipped that generation because none of my uncles or my aunties are in coffee but us as the children um, we're sort of realizing that we have to go back to farming it has to kind of go back to what the source like tie into the soil and because once we create that value system for um, for our generation, then it's easy for us to pass it on. This is on the continent. So um, what we've created is that we kind of reinvent, we, we're not reinventing, but we're changing sort of how business is done. So previously, the coffee farmer would not really get any value. They would bring cherries. Um, just a quick overview of how coffee works. So there's cherries that get milled, they become beans, and the beans don't turn to gold until they're roasted. And essentially when they turn to gold, you kind of want to sell them pretty quickly because the freshness you know, kind of wears, I mean, they're not as fresh uh, when the longer they stay. So what usually happened is that the coffee farmer only takes the berries to the miller, who then turns it into a bean that is exported to whatever country it's going to be roasted in, in green form. And the people that really make the money are the roasters, the people that actually uh, create that. So what we change is we change a couple of things, is we're empowering these farmers. We've come together with them. They're small-scale farmers. They're the only ones we work with, people with 500, 500, 500 thousand um, acres or less um, and what we do with them is we go in and we bring them in a commune five at least five of them they have to be at least five and they come together and they combine a little like you were saying the power of of uh, a commune the power of coming together and sharing so we they come together they buy a washing station so they harvest their coffee, the cherries, they um, wash them so they become beans and then they automatically sell it to us and what that what that happens that we after that we mill it and we we bring it here so we sell it directly and then from here we uh, with those um, with the little washing stations we have a value where we we give back to whatever it is that is sold here so what that has made is that our farmers are more confident about their 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 crop they're more confident about their place in that chain and they're saying that we're probably one of the only people who really actually ask them how 
they you know how is their farm doing how is the crop doing how was the harvest this year so that's changing and then on this side um, we're lucky because we live in a community that's really fantastic people know their coffee here people know people are socially conscious but what we've found is that there's a lot of education that needs to happen we all drink coffee we don't know where it comes from we don't know why coffee is valuable we don't know what farmers where are these farmers why is coffee from Africa why does it taste different than the other so what we've done is that we've created a, a space where we can have conversations about not only buying a cup of coffee but buying a cup of coffee knowing who the farmer is and knowing how it's actually profited them as a whole and what we found is that in, in, to in totality, uh, both communities are starting to respect each other and starting to support each other. And hopefully, the sustainability will keep, will keep increasing and, and staying on. For me, uh, the answer is uh a very holistic approach and it's from the perspective of of creating a healthy society because at this moment we're living in a traumatized traumatized society so we need to change that and to develop that critical thinking in the individuals towards developing confidence and trust first of all on themselves. We were asking before how we develop trust. If you do not trust yourself, you do not, you do not trust anyone. So if you trust in yourself, you will develop in the capacity of each individual around you and you will, you will be secure, that, uh, very assured that you can work together in cooperation. So myself, with the knowledge that I have, I think there is no other way that plant that seed of confidence in the individual and the ambition to discover, to discover who I am and what I can do to change this society. That is the uh, strength and the, the uh, direction that I'm following. It does not matter who you are or what you do. There are four things that you need in order to function and to create value. You need space, you need time, you need energy, and you need material, all right? Without which, you cannot create exchangeable value to be able to sustain yourself. Um, and unfortunately, what we do in this world is we make it particularly expensive to access energy and material, and we wind up having to spend more time, um, oh, and also to access space. Oh, we want to have this exchange more and more of our time in order to, create, to survive. Um, now, we talk about buy-in, right? Buy-in happens when you feel you have control over your own destiny. Um, and so, in essence, to cre increase the buy-in, we have to um, more or less enable us as human beings to access all four of those factors. Again, time, energy, material, and space. All right, and this is where the Georges come in and talk about land, land as the passive factor, land as a critical um, variable. And they go and they talk about, well, let's, let's, let's go and collect rents. Um, there's a lot of variance to that. Uh, I'm gonna leave that as be, I'm, I'm sure Kisio can talk more about that, and as can Ethel, so, but there's also pollution, there's also natural resources that are absolutely critical in enabling people to have the ability to control their lives and to have that buy-in ultimately. Um, so I, as long as we can secure those things for every single person on this planet, buy-in will eventually happen. We've got, we have a total of about eight minutes. So okay. those who haven't spoken so, should speak and then I have yeah. some particular questions which I'll address. Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any particular questions if there's only a couple of minutes. Or you know. Thank you. Um, just as a uh, summary, I think the question was in what ways are we using each of our experiences uh, to impact global economies on a larger scale? And, 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 yeah, the, what occurred to me as a unifying bit is mm -hmm. 
the buy-in. What is the, the buy-in? Buys into the process. Yes. The, the, the homeless buy into the process. Mm -hmm. The farmer buys literally into the. I don't mean literally. Right. Pays, but it's, it's part of the process now, much more mm -hmm. fully economically mm -hmm. speaking. That's I think. Uh, and, play, and play the interaction again. Mm -hmm. the interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I think piggybacking on what everybody else has uh, spoken about, one added layer um, that I can speak to is what technology is doing in each and every one of these cases. Whether it's uh, being a student in school, you've got some element of technology that is enabling the learning of the student. Whether it's a farmer, there's some element of technology that is allowing for them to get their produce to market. Um, if it's play, there's some form of technology that a child or any individual interacts with in order to um, really disseminate their playful experience. Um, it's interesting because in the West, this is a conversation that I have all the time with my peers, in the West you have uh, situations where we have three screens here. You've got your laptop, you've got your Kindle or your iPad, and then you've got your smartphone. In uh, international cities, in emerging markets, a lot of the times they only have one screen. Mobile is king around the world, except in the West. And I think most of their interactions are just functional on that one screen. Um, the way the communities around the world are really buying into these processes, in terms of education, you've got communities around the world who are now interacting um, with a new system that is available um, on iPad or sort of like a dumbed down iPad for, for kids in, in the village. And what that is doing is that is enabling them to interact with people who are across, with kids across the world in playful situations, playful apps, playful technologies that they can access remotely. Um, in the case of farming, we've got a lot of apps that are coming up right now which are accessible on mobile for these communities that are in emerging markets, farming regions, ranching regions, um, crop growing regions, where they're able to grade their produce or their coffee bean or their corn just by taking a picture of that specific produce and that is able to grade them in enabling them to sort of understand at what level they'll be able to sell and what um, amount they'll be able to sell at market price. So there's different ways that technology is really layering into a lot of the elements of what what is happening on a global scale. Um, whether it's in education or in farming or mostly what a lot of what we're seeing as well is in transport. You've got um, a lot of communities that are needing better roads to access different communities, whether you're coming from the uh, more rural region to get into the city in order to compete for jobs. This morning we had a really good uh, talk, a panel talk about um, the jobs creation. What is going to happen in the future? Will robots take over our jobs? And in communities that are not quite there yet, they're not quite as westernized, a lot of the solutions can be found really at the grassroots, mm -hmm. transport, food, crop growing. And it's, it's excellent to see in different ways we're all interacting with each other, because I think there's some commonality in ways that we can disseminate that knowledge. So I have, I believe, what is a follow-up question to all that, and invite you all to dis discuss amongst yourselves in front of us. And that is th this access to technology. How is the infrastructure paid for? How does that come about in certain regions? I mean, I have no idea in a world that's very rural, do the cell towers pop up in particular places for what reason? Who's paying for that and who's, or who's maybe even renting out that land and deriving income from where that, and, and thereby uh, directing where the cell towers power up in the first place? So if, um, if that's clear enough, yeah, right. Yeah. It, it, look. Just to piggyback off of what I was speaking about earlier. And the question that you posed is, how is that being funded? Um, which is w exactly what we are doing at Globally, which is what I've been doing for the past four or five years, which is happy, uh, finding ways to get funding into the hands of people who are forming these technological solutions that I just went over. And there isn't any real unified way that exists at this moment. It's very fragmented. Um, if, for example, a Silicon Valley investor wants to 
discover or find a way to disrupt ranching in Brazil. There's really no unified way unless he particularly purchases a ticket and flies into Brazil and purposefully seeks out an innovator who is disrupting the ranching industry. If, say for example, somebody in New York, a financier in New York, wants to find a new way to fund micro-organizations uh, micro that are helping poor people at a particular slum in some city in South Africa or India, there's no unified way to do that unless they purchase a flight ticket and fly all the way into the particular city that they're looking to um, find how to fund these organizations, there really is no unified way and that is what we're building at Globally. It has been um, an experience, we actually attended the follow-up to the Global Entrepreneurship Summit that uh, President Barack Obama sort of pioneered and last year, is I think it was earlier this year, they had it in uh, Nairobi and the follow-up was in San Francisco. And what was very interesting, listening to a panel of experts from around the world who um, really had flown into Africa and were discussing solutions to real grassroots problem, the unified problem that every single one of them uh, pretty much just posed is we don't know, if I wanted right now to open up my computer and create a solution or find some sort of avenue to give back in some sort of funding way or knowledge-based way, there's no solution to do that. And I found it very interesting that we live in the Bay Area, which is um, <coughs> the leader in technology, the leader of innovation, and there's no particular way. And so what is exciting, to answer back to you answer your question, is that if at all big organizations, big financing companies wanted to fund these organizations, I think the best way to do that, number one, is to talk. There's a lot of conversation that does not happen. People just do not know. And I think um, by having organizations like this, by having forums like this, where people get to know uh, what everybody else is doing, I think that is awesome. I have no idea what my sister does um, for Latin American communities, but I'm excited to connect with her because then now I will be able to have a foothold in her region for the investors that we work with um, who are seeking particular ways to fund the organizations in her community. I want to tease out a question. Do you mind if I just add just something real quick to that? Yeah, and just everything my sister here has said in absolute is really what the, um, the current environment is in the market today. But the most beautiful thing about it is that it is ripe for innovation. Now is the time for folks who are thinking about what solutions to make for the world to come up and step up to the plate. Now is the time for folks who want to invest in solutions that can target a larger population that are conscious to step up to the plate and fund those projects. There are no government subsidies in these communities. The government is not running to solve the problems of its people. So it is the people who realize what their problems are at the grassroots level who are seeking out opportunities to be able to create solutions or to solve those problems for themselves. So I want to tease out from the Bay Region's perspective, uh, something to see how applicable this might be in Kenya, Ethiopia perhaps, and elsewhere. And that is, in the Bay Area, housing, real estate is an enormous issue. The ground values are rising precipitously, and it occurs to some of us that these rising land values, having been generated by the growth of community, those values themselves should be what is funding public education. That's itself what should be funding perhaps cross-subsidies for those of a lower income. And how might this value of geography itself be socialized rather than privatized, and whether that model is meaningful in a rural setting, I don't know, but I, I believe in a more urban setting, including London, say, on homelessness, the, the ground value of London is twice, as I understand it, uh, the, the rest of UK. The ground value of, of the rest of the UK's ground, ground value, why not use that for purpose? Whenever we build infrastructure, whether we're talking about roads, um, shipping lanes, canals, 
telecommunication systems. Um, it benefits everyone that's within that network. Let's be clear about that. Um, the coffee that comes from Africa gets to us because we're able to secure the shipping lanes. We're able to build those ports, both on the African continent and elsewhere, the European continent, the South American continent, wherever else. Um, the fact that we have cell phone towers, that arises because, again, um, uh, the first towers were government financed. Um, government had to build that. Uh, you know what? And let me answer this in a different way. The course I teach at Temple University is called Tech Transformations. It's the history of technolog technological developments in the U.S. from 1800 to 1960. And what we see is that there, there's, when we talk about the steam engine, when we talk about the railroad, the telegraph, um, the telephone, the radio, both of them were built by varying combinations for each one by corporate and by government entities. Every single time that we built that, we facilitated the people to exchange at a greater rate. Um, more values created, more demand to be in those areas um, resulted, and with increased demand, with a fixed supply, the values go up. In effect, the productivity of society increases, increases the value of the land. Society made land more valuable, mm -hmm. and that makes the value of land, that increase, um, a social product. One of the key principles that needs to be observed economically going forward is that the creator of value, exchangeable value, needs to be who, they who determine it, whether it's the individual, because I made something, or the society, because they provided the means for the individual to self-determine. And I suspect that's where you're coming from, uh, whether we do it with land value taxation, whether we do it with royalties and natural resources, accessing the EM spectrum, none of which any of us created, okay? Uh, radio existed before we walked on this planet. Let's be clear about that. Uh, just the fact that we access it is great. The fact that we sell it to cable companies or telecommunications companies to use exclusively portions of the EM spectrum is a direct violation of this principle. Uh, the fact that we give entire companies mines, uh, tracts of land, without any due compensation for the value that society gave them is a direct violation. Um, and it is what causes the homelessness problem in the United Kingdom. The fact that because of the green belts and the imbalance of the council tax more upon building, which is effectively the productivity of human beings, than upon the land itself, results in uh, the higher cost of goods, higher cost of living, not enough jobs, and hence the, pr the, the production of homeless people, both in the UK and the United States and elsewhere. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass this over and give you a chance to speak. Yeah, thank you. I mean, from from a UK perspective, and you know, London uh, homelessness and housing issue. I mean, how there is, you know, it, it seems similar here as to London, the sort of housing crisis and the lack of affordable housing. That there's a fundamental disconnect between the the purpose of housing the primary purpose of housing to be providing accommodation and security to people as opposed to uh, uh, housing being a capital asset yeah and uh, at the moment in london you know the, the primary role of housing is a capital asset and there's now a significant proportion of london property which is 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 held by people not to live in but just as a safer uh, uh, you know economic investment than gold or coffee or shares or stocks now the whole brexit thing you know <laughs> might pull you know the one tiny glimmer of uh, light uh, in in what it seems to be quite a, a dark episode you know if 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 there was you know a, a shrinkage and you know a run of capital out of the london property market then it might make it uh, possible for people and families and uh, you know uh, to, to you know to live again you know at the moment it's got you know it, it, it's unsustainable the current direction of travel of uh, you know income average income levels and the price of renting and purchasing property in London is 
you know, it, it's unsustainable and it's, it's about that fundamental disconnect that the primary value, the primary purpose of housing is accommodation, not capital. So I'll speak to what I know, being a resident here and having participated in a lot of the municipal discussions, is that it's easy to think of a solution where if you're building homes, part of what you need to think about while you're building those houses is that some of that money that comes from those homes should go toward education, building parks, etc. And that's great when you have a check and balance in place where you've got folks who will go into a city council meeting and they will ensure that before a builder erects a building in the middle of town that, you know, a portion of the payment that he pays to the folks that live in that beautiful city will go toward resources that belong to the people. That becomes a little bit difficult um, to check and balance in other communities that have perhaps not reached to that state of running a government or developing modern infrastructure. But there's a process as well that's, that works just fine for that people. So for example in Kenya, if you want to build a cell tower and it hap you know, your line of, of building happens to be in somebody's piece of land, you will have to pay that person. And you will need to negotiate fair market price for that person based on what they value their home at. So there are checks and balances. It's not all chaos there. There's, there is a process that works that is starkly different from what we quote unquote would call the modern way of doing things or, or doing modern building. But it's got a ways to go because it's still privatized, it's still a private institution that's going in and that, that's doing all of this work, it will be great when there is government buy-in. Um, of, of course, that will be important, but at, right now, I think what matters is that if we are trying to create solutions, and especially the global market, that we understand what the social setting for that market that we're building solutions looks like, so that when we build something there, we provide a, a resource there, that that resource is meaningful to that, pe to that group of people. Yeah. I'm going to refine the question, but I believe Kesey has something to add on just now. Yes, exactly, because... Oh. Well, I'm just going to... Okay, go, go. Uh, the refining observation I wish to make in this analysis is, uh, in the instance of the cell tower provider, having to rent the land at fair market value from the landowner. I want to make a distinction between land not made mm -hmm. and the cell tower which is made. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, in that instance, put the blame with the cell tower owner. I would say, where, where does the landowner get off saying, you have to pay me for something I didn't make? And that has value because of the surrounding community that wants access to the cell tower, yes, but the cell tower can't exist absent a location. You no, I don't have nothing else. Oh. I was mm -hmm. to and, I, and, and the same goes with, uh, speaks to the, the provision, say, of housing. I wouldn't say to the developer, uh, we're going to tax you for putting up, and I think Frank was speaking to this to some degree, or maybe fully, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say to the developer of the, of the apartment, we're going to tax you for putting up the apartment. I would say, where does the landowner get off saying to the developer, you have to pay me a, the value of this geography prior to you being able to put up the building. And that's what I would, I might, it's called economic rent, but the idea that locational value, the geography, the place to play in, where do we, the buy-in, I believe has something to do with where we're playing. And that value is in fact community, exactly. perhaps, but I, if you have anyone wants to elaborate just, on that. Just to, just to close uh, on, that, on that note, because it's, it's really important to distinguish exactly the value of the location. And in the case when I have expressed that uh, we live in an ill society, precisely, precisely has to do with that. Because in Central America, in, in my, the, which is the area that I know, I'm very familiar, what's going on, familiar with what's going on there. I could say how ill is in the sense that people are getting evicted from the communities, entire communities, in order to put the land 
at the service of foreigner investors, and that is globalization, and that is development, that is bringing technology, but at the cost of human beings, a whole community, and destroying uh, the sense of humanity, just that. So we have to take that in consideration and to learn in reality that, yes, there gotta be a check and balance, as you said, because development and, and uh, progress involves the, the land, the environment, to keep it for next generations. But when it comes to privatization, it's excluding a lot, a whole bunch of people, of millennials have no hope in my country drug uh, landlords and uh, how you call lords of drug, of drug uh, is, is taking over a whole north coast and people really are coming to this country. Children are crossing the frontier alone and now they are in the scare because they're going to deport them with what's going on in this election year and what's going to happen. You know, so we live in an ill society. In some part, we feel that we are advancing. We are part of that advancement. But the generality, the general uh, perspective, I think is really important because it has to do not for a little group or an individual. And this is what I'm saying when I start talking about the uh, neoliberalism is that involves structures and determinations that are the rule of the modality. And you have to follow that. It's privatization, austerity, and it's not the government and, and not the people who are buying the land that is paying for those debts that I'm creating. It's the people. So what do we have to do? We have to take in consideration the structural uh, composture of what the economy, that global economy, is doing right now. Yeah. I think uh, there's an element of communities, indigenous communities around the world. Um, really just setting the value of their land prior to any other group coming in mm -hmm. to determine that value. And I'll give a case in point example of our collective country. Um, there's a region in our country that is particularly very dry. Northern Kenya is a very dry region. And it's not very well inhabited because um, you can't grow crops there, um, you can't keep cattle there. Um, really, there's no form of industry there. There's no um, sense of economy there. I think. Um, pretty much what the country has resolved over many years is that it's not a really great inhabitable region. So you'll have more uh, um, refugee centers there where we house refugees that come in across the border. Um, but above and beyond that, it's been recently discovered in the last five years that there is um, the possibility of oil in this particular region. And what is happening is as soon as that discovery happened, you've got these communities that are ignorant to the value of their land. Um, and you've got outside groups, first of all, at the regional level coming in and you know trying to determine what, trying to tell these communities what the value of their land is um, and relocate them if, if possible. Uh, but this is land that these communities have inhabited over millennia, this is, this is, this is their home. Um, and then you have the government of Kenya coming in and trying to determine the, the value of this land. And then you've got the big multinationals who come in and negotiate with the government of Kenya, who negotiate with the people, you know, the local regional chiefs and elders, um, really overlooking the indigenous communities who live in the land itself and who were largely ignored until the possibility of oil um, you know, came about. And we know how the US is and how Middle Eastern countries are when it comes to oil, that they will occupy you in, in, a, in a quick second. And so what the struggle is that we are finding in our country is who determines the value of that land? Is it the local economy, the local community that determines the, the value of that land? Or is it us as a, as a Kenyan people? I mean, this is a big deal for us, um, above and beyond tourism, which is our leading, um, a leading income earner. Oil would be would be a very big deal, but then that brings into play, you know, um, 
international underground mechanisms, uh, financial movement, financial dealings, because then you're playing at a global level. Um, and so my challenge, I think, in, in regards to who determines the land value, I think it's these communities is determining what the value of your land is, regardless of whether they find gold or diamonds or oil mm -hmm. beneath it. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in. I need to wrap up. Okay. We're going to continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. We're going. We, we need to close this because the sole pro presentation going on at this time is going to begin, or may have just begun next door. It's a panel discussion on uh, land and and housing crisis. So that's going on next door and will be very soon. But I we we've opened up. I think the 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 best can of worms uh, to, to lure us. To, to the big fish, and uh, that's I, I, perhaps going to be addressed next door. In any event, we'll continue, if we wish, this conversation in the free time after the presentation next door. So thank you so much. Let's round of applause for our, our panelists.